Originally introduced in the 1960s, the T1 line at a 1.544 megabit per second rate was designed to carry 24 pulse code modulated speech signal streams, each at 64 kilobits per second. Today, T1s, also known as DS1s, are used for many purposes. They carry voice or data in the network, or they are directly leased to end users. Mobile carriers also commonly use T1 lines to connect base stations back to the MSC, the central office switch. In this session will provide an overview of T1 fundamentals. First, we will learn about voice encoding. Then we will look at how time division multiplexing is used on T1 lines. We will next learn about T1 framing and the concepts of the superframe and the extended superframe, or SF and ESF. Finally, we will learn about the various T1 network elements. Pulse code modulation, or PCM, is used to digitize a voice conversation and to insert it on a T1 line. From the analog voice signal, 8,000 samples per second are taken, equivalent to a rate of 8 kHz. A sample is a measurement of the level of the analog signal. This sample is then converted into an 8-bit value. These 8-bit values provide 256 different levels of the analog signal. The G711 mu law algorithm is used in North America to map the voice spectrum into these 256 different levels. Once it has been converted into a digital signal, the voice stream is transmitted at a rate of 64 kilobits per second, which is also called the DS0 rate. DS0, or Digital Signal 0, is the basis of the digital signal hierarchy, where the individual DS0s are multiplexed to form higher capacity circuits. The DS0 carries a single digitized phone call at 64 kilobits per second. The DS1 signal takes 24 of the DS0 channels and uses time division multiplexing, or TDM, to multiplex them into a single bit stream. Each of the GS0 channels is transmitted 8 bits at a time on a single bit stream. The multiplexing is octet oriented, and 8 bits for each channel are contiguous. Each channel is also called a time slot. A T1 carries 24 GS0 channels, so it multiplexes time slot 0 through time slot 23. In order to identify the beginning of the multiplex stream, that is, time slot 0, on the receiving side, a framing bit is inserted. The basic T1 frame is 193 bits long, with 8 bits for each of the 24 channels and 1 bit for framing. This results in a T1 data rate of 193 bits, transmitted at 8 kHz equivalent to 1.544 megabits per second. The receiver must be able to detect the framing bit in order to synchronize. The framing bits were selected to form a sequence of zeros and ones over several frames. The bit sequence selected for the framing pattern is chosen to have a low probability of occurring, and therefore a low probability of being mistaken in the data payload. Once the framing bit is found, the beginning of each 193 bits frame is known, and synchronization is achieved. Signaling is used for call control, such as establishing or tearing down a call connection. Signaling can be transmitted in several ways. One of these methods is channel-associated signaling, or CAS which uses a rod bit taken from the DS0 channel voice signal to indicate progress. Every six speech samples, 
the least significant bits of every channel is robbed to transfer the A and B bits that are used to carry signaling. This has a negligible impact on the voice quality. The concept of robbed bit signaling was later replaced by common channel signaling, or CCS, which uses a dedicated channel to carry signaling information. Examples of CCS would be SS7 for PSTN interoffice trunk signaling and ISDN D channel signaling for connecting an end user PBX. The concept of a T1 superframe, which consists of 12 193 bit frames, was added to find the A and B bits used in CAS signaling. The receiver must find the beginning of each superframe in addition to finding the beginning of each frame. This is accomplished through a low probability pattern of ones and zeros at the beginning of every other frame, with the remaining six frames carrying the pattern to identify the 193 bits frames. The receiving side needs to observe the framing bits to synchronize on the super frame and on the regular frames. This chart shows the super frame's frame structure. There are 12 frames, each with 193 bits. Note how the pattern of zeros and ones is at the beginning of every other frame. The signaling A and B bits are inserted in the low order bits of frames 6 and 12 for every channel. The extended super frame technique, which groups 24 193 bits frames, was created to add additional information for monitoring the quality of the T1 line. Because it has 24 frames, the ESF has 24 framing bits. Six are used for frame alignment signals. Another six bits are allocated to a cyclic redundancy check, or CRC, and the remaining 12 bits are allocated to the data link channel. The CRC detects bit errors in the data bits, and the data link channel can be used for a system monitoring traffic. For example, HDLC frames, or high-level data link control frames, are exchanged for control, testing, and status monitoring. The ESF, which starts with a frame alignment sequence, has a set of four robbed bits, A, B, C, and D, allowing for more signaling states. Note that for the ESF, the framing is no longer a low probability sequence of zeros and ones. The receiver will simply synchronize on the frame alignment signal and CRC fields since the probability of finding matching FASs and CRCs in the frame is low. Finding these fields allows for synchronization. This shows the first 12 frames of an ESS frame structure. As in T1 framing, and as with a super frame, the ESF is comprised of 193-bit frames. Every fourth frame begins with a frame alignment signal. Every other frame begins with a data channel bit. The remaining frames begin with a CRC bit. There are also a total of four robbed bits. There are two in the first 12 frames of the ESF's structure. This continued chart shows the second half of the ESF's 24 frames. Finally, here are the T1 network elements. In North America, CSUs or customer service units are owned by the end user. They provide loopback capability, indicator lights, monitor jacks, and split access for troubleshooting and installation debugging. Network interface units, or NIUs, 
are owned by the carrier but located on the customer's premises and they provide the demarcation points. Often also called the smart jack, the NIU provides signal loopback, sends alarm indication signals, or sends an idle signal when the customer's signal is unplugged. It also provides performance monitoring information. Smart jacks can also do SF and ESF framing conversions. The medium for T1 transmissions is twisted copper pair cabling. Fiber and radio are also possible, but they are less common. Digital cross-connect systems, or DACs, are used to rearrange and interconnect lower-level channels such as DS0s into higher-level signals such as DS1s. A DAX can also accommodate higher rates such as T3 or synchronous optical networking, also known as SONNET. D4 channel banks convert ordinary telephone wires to 64 kilobits per second channels for multiplexing onto a DS1. M13 multiplexers, which are higher order multiplexers for DS1s, take up to 28 DS1s and multiplex them into a DS3. The DS1 framing and payload are passed by a DS3 signal. A PBX and a C5 switch concentrates connections to local subscribers or inter-office trunks. In this training, we have learned about some T1 fundamentals. We have seen how a voice conversation is encoded using pulse code modulation, as well as how DS0 channels, also known as time slots, are multiplexed into a single bit stream using time division multiplexing. We also looked at the structure of a basic T1 frame and how it allows for synchronization through the framing bits at the beginning of each frame. We saw how channel associated signaling and common channel signaling can be used to transmit call progress. Finally, we looked at the structures of the superframe and the extended superframe. We concluded with an overview of the most common T1 network elements. For more information, contact VX at 510-651-0500 or on our website at www.vxinc.com. Dot com.